Hi everyone, my name is Anika and welcome back to 8th grade science with All STEM. Today's video covers the ecosystem standard. It talks about the factors of an ecosystem, the relationships between organisms, and the flow of energy. As always, each of our review questions is timestamped, so you can skip the explanations for questions you feel confident in and move directly on to the next timestamp. Also, make sure to check out our links for further reference page at the end of the video for extra practice. This page has links that go with each question, so you can dive deeper into the challenging ones. It's linked in the description box. All right, let's get started with the first question. Question one, classify the following as biotic or abiotic. Temperature, tree, mold, carbon, dead organism, rock, salinity, bacteria, water, and bird. If you need more time to look at the options, go ahead and pause the video here. Okay, so this is the answer. The biotic factors are tree, mold, dead organism, bacteria, and bird. And the abiotic factors are temperature, carbon dioxide, rock, salinity, and water. So first of all, what is a biotic or abiotic factor? Biotic factors are all the living or once living factors or components of an ecosystem. Abiotic factors are all the non-living elements and conditions of an ecosystem. So some of the options in this question are fairly self-explanatory, such as tree, rock, and bird. We know that tree and bird are definitely living organisms, and a rock is a non-living element of an ecosystem. But there are some confusing options. So some of the confusing options in this question may be mold, a dead organism, temperature, carbon dioxide, and water. Let's go through these. Mold is a biotic factor because it is a living thing. It's a fungi. This makes it biotic. A dead organism is still a biotic factor because one of the conditions for biotic factors is once living. It still contributes to the ecosystem as it de decomposes. Temperature is a condition of the environment. This isn't a living factor. And the same logic applies for salinity. Carbon dioxide, although important for living things, is still just a gas. Gases and other chemical factors are abiotic. And this same logic applies to water. Although important for living things, it is not a living factor. Question two, organize the following from most specific category to most general category, community, organism, population, and ecosystem. So the answer is organism, population, community, and ecosystem. So the most specific category is the one that contains the least organisms. The most general is the one that contains the most organisms. So obviously, organism would be the most specific category because it contains only one living thing. The next most specific category is population. Population is all of the organisms of the same species that live in one area. This is the next most specific because it only includes one species. The next category is community. A community is all the interacting populations in an area. This is more general than population because a community is made up of populations of different species. The most general category of the ones listed is an ecosystem. This is all the living and non-living things in an area. All the living things would be the community of that ecosystem. The non-living things would be the abiotic factors in that area. Question three. Due to a drought in species A's habitat, there isn't enough water for all of the organisms of species A. Many of them die of thirst and the total population number goes down. In this situation, the lack of water is a A, biotic factor, B, limiting factor, C, man-made factor, D, all of the above. So the answer is B, limiting factor. So what is a limiting factor? 
A limiting factor is a factor that restricts a population's size and either reduces it or stops it from growing at all. Examples of limiting factors can be a scarce resource, a natural disaster, or a disease. Based on these limiting factors, a population will have a carrying capacity. This is the number of organisms of a population that can live in an ecosystem before they start dying off. Let's take the water example above. Let's say that there are only 10 available gallons of water every day in the entire ecosystem. For the purposes of this example, we assume that the only living things in the ecosystem are members of species A. If each member of species A needs to consume an entire gallon of water a day to survive, then only 10 organisms can survive in that ecosystem because there's only water for 10 of them. This means that 10 is the carrying capacity of the ecosystem. If there are more than 10 members of species A, the ones that don't get sufficient water will die off, bringing the population back down to 10. The lack of water is limiting the population to only 10 organisms, making it a limiting factor. This is what a carrying capacity graph looks like. So the blue dashed line in the center is the carrying capacity. The y-axis is the number of organisms and the x-axis is time. So as soon as the population goes above carrying capacity, which is right about here, some of the organisms die because the ecosystem can't support that many organisms. And the population goes back below carrying capacity right here. Then the population reproduces and ends up going over carrying capacity again, but then it has to come back down because the ecosystem can't support it. This cycle just continues, which is why this graph goes up and down and up and down. Question four, classify the following as density dependent limiting factors or density independent limiting factors, natural disasters, competition for food, environmental changes, predation, and disease. So the answers to this question are, the density dependent factors are competition for food, predation, and disease. And the density independent factors are natural disasters and environmental changes. So what are density dependent and density independent factors? Density dependent limiting factors are factors that affect the population based on how many organisms there are in an ecosystem. In these cases, the population is more strongly affected if there are more of them. The density dependent factors in this question are competition for food, predation, and disease. Competition for any resource is density dependent because the more organisms there are in a population, the less resources each one gets. If there is a good amount of four organism, good amount of food for four organisms, but the population has 12 organisms, they'll have to compete for food. Predation is also dependent on how many organisms there are. It depends on how many predators and how much prey there is. Disease is density dependent because disease spreads from organism to organism quicker if they are closer together. When there are more organisms, each one has less space and they are closer together, which makes diseases more likely to spread between them. Density independent limiting factors are factors that will affect the population no matter how big it is, whether it's 10 organisms or 100. Many of these are environmental changes or events or human caused changes. The density independent factors in this question are natural disasters and environmental changes. Natural disasters will affect any population in their path, regardless of population size. The population size has nothing to do with the cause or severity of the natural disaster. Environmental changes will also affect any population in their respective areas. These include deforestation, increased levels of a certain toxin, and climate changes. Question five. Fill in the following blanks in the sentences about predator-prey graphs. Okay, so the answers to these sentences. The first sentence says, if the predator population increases, the prey population decreases. The second one, if the predator population decreases, the prey population increases. The third one, if the prey population increases, the predator population increases. 
And the fourth one, if the prey, prey population decreases, the predator population decreases. So before even looking at the predator prey graph, we can use the concepts of predation to figure out whether each population increases or decreases. So for the first one, if the predator population increases, what happens to the prey? If there are more predators eating the prey, it only makes sense that more of the prey will be dying. So the population will decrease. For the second one, the same concept applies the other way around. If the predator population decreases and there are less predators to eat the prey, the prey population will increase because they are not being eaten as much. Third, on the third one, now we switch to the prey. If the prey population increases, what happens to the predators? If they have more food to eat, it makes sense that the predators would reproduce more, so the population would increase. And the same applies vice versa. If the prey population decreases and there's less food for the predators, the predator population would also decrease. This is a predator prey graph. So the green line here is the prey and the red line is the predator. And the y axis is the number of organisms and the x axis is the time. So both the prey and predator lines fluctuate based on each other. This is what happens in a stable ecosystem. When prey numbers go up, which is this green line right here, when prey numbers go up, the predator numbers go up shortly after. So now the predator numbers have gone up. This causes the prey numbers to go down because there's more predators eating the prey. So then after the prey, predator numbers go up, the prey numbers go down, which causes the predator numbers to go down. This causes the prey numbers to go up again, which starts the cycle all over again. Question six. Species A and species B live in the same type of tree. They both eat the same type of worm. They both need the same type of materials to make their nests. These two species have the same blank. They can or cannot live in the same area. So the answers are niche and cannot. So these two species have the same niche. They cannot live in the same area. A species niche is its ecological role. It includes all the conditions the species needs for its survival. Examples include the temperature it needs, where it needs to lay its eggs, where it needs to, and where it needs to make its home. And the impacts the species has on its environment and the organisms around it. Examples include what it eats, when it eats that, and what it does that helps the environment. When and what a species eats is a really big part of its niche because food is one of the main factors for competition between species. So why can't two organisms with the same niche live in the same area? Because of competition. In the question above, if species A and B both need the same type of tree to live in, the same type of worm to eat, and the same type of materials for their nests, they would have to compete for those materials. There are only a limited number of trees, worms, and materials. Eventually, the stronger species will outcompete the weaker species to the point where it either goes ex extinct in that area or the population moves away. A common question on EOGs is whether two species that eat the exact same food can live in the same area, or whether two species that eat different foods can live in the same area. If it's the exact same food, they cannot live in the same area due to competition. If it's different foods, unless there are other factors in play, they can definitely live in the same area. Question 7. Identify the following as parasitism, mutualism, or commensalism. A. A bee and a flower. B. A flea that lives on a dog. C. Cattle egrets that eat the insects stirred up by cows as they walk or graze on grass. Okay, so the answers are A, mutualism, B, parasitism, and C, commensalism. All three of the relationships listed here are symbiotic relationships, which are interactions between organisms that live closely together. Parasitism is when one organism is benefited by the interaction and the other one is harmed. The interaction when a flea lives on a dog is parasitism because the flea is being helped by sucking blood from the dog, but that's not good for the dog. Mutualism is when both organisms are benefited from the interaction. 
The interaction between a bee and a flower is mutualism because a bee gets nectar from a flower and a flower gets pollinated by the bee. Commensalism is when one organism is benefited and the other organism is not affected at all, positively or negatively. The interaction between cattle egrets and cows is commensalism because the cows are not affected by the interaction at all. They're not stirring up the insects on purpose. The cattle egrets are benefited by these insects. So the answers are corn is the producer, mouse is the primary consumer, and the owl is the secondary consumer. The producer is at the bottom of the food chain. Producers are the autotrophs of the food chain. Autotrophs are the organisms that take energy from the sun and make it into chemical energy, basically plants. The producer of a food chain is always a plant. The plant here is the corn, and that's why it's at the bottom of the chain. The primary consumer is the herbivore of the food chain. Herbivores are organisms that only eat plants. The mouse eats the corn. The secondary consumer is the organism that eats the primary consumer. It can be a carnivore if it only eats meat or an omnivore if it can eat plants and meat. The secondary consumer is the owl because it eats the mouse. You can keep going further and further up the food chain with tertiary consumer for third, quaternary for fourth, and more. But if there are many consumers, you may only need to single out the primary consumer and then call the rest consumers in general. What's important to know from a food chain is from which organism to which organism the energy flows. It always starts with the producer, aka the plant, then goes to the primary consumer, then to the thing that eats the primary consumer, and so on until you reach the top of the food chain. Question 9. What type of organism breaks down dead organisms and returns the nutrients in those organisms back to the environment so that they can be reused by other organisms? The answer is decomposers. The role of decomposers in the environment is to return the nutrients from dead things back to the environment so that other organisms can reuse those materials. They do this by feeding on dead organisms and then breaking down those organisms into the minerals, substances, organic materials, and other things that make them up. These simple broken down substances can then be reused in the environment. All right, like I said at the beginning of the video, if you need extra practice with these topics, make sure to check out the links for further reference page. If this video was helpful for you, please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.